Bueno. Muy buenas tardes, compañeros y compañeras de la prensa. Gracias por acompañarnos a esta conferencia de prensa de la 24 edición del Festival Internacional de Cine Guanajuato. Estamos aquí con el director Todd Stephens para hablar de la película inaugural Swan Song, que ya veremos en la gala de esta noche. Y nos acompaña para conducir esta conferencia de prensa Arturo Garibay, crítico de cine, periodista especializado en cine y editor de Top Cinema. Así que le cedo la palabra a Arturo. Muchas gracias, Jonathan. A ver, vamos a hacer la magia aquí, el truco. Eh, eh, eh. Ahí está. ¿Sí? ¿No? Ya, lo logramos. Lo logramos. Eh, muchísimas gracias por estar aquí hoy en esta rueda de prensa. Ya lo mencionó Jonathan. Eh, rueda de prensa de la película inaugural del Festival Internacional de Cine de Guanajuato, GIF 24. Eh, además, creo yo, primer día de actividades con una particularidad muy especial porque es el primer día en el que el GIF, perdón, el GIF se celebra en la ciudad de León, ¿no? Entonces, particularmente significativo. Y bueno, aquí está con nosotros Todd Stephens, director de Swan Song. Todd, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Does that work? Yeah, yeah. I'm great, thank you. Uh, welcome, How are you? Welcome to Mexico, welcome to Leon. Is this your first time in Leon? Yes, yeah, yeah, first how, time. How Just got you, here today, yeah. yeah, yeah. How do you like it so I far? I love it, it's great. Yeah, we were in San Miguel for two days before we came here, which was fabulous. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful day. Yeah. I, I've been, I, I watched the movie already. Oh, cool. So I've been thinking a lot about it. I enjoyed watching the movie. I had a great time watching it, but I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. So, so, I'm gonna do uh, what I do in a different way. Sometimes I just talk to the directors. But now I wrote some uh, stuff down. Okay. Because I don't, I don't want to forget anything. So it's okay if, if from time to time I read. Absolutely. So, yeah, okay. So let's go. Let's yeah. start talking about the movie. Okay. And I think it's important to start for the beginning. Um, The movie opens with these words, inspired by a true icon. Mm -hmm. So what exactly drew you to Pat Pitzenbarger as the subject of a film? Mm -hmm. um, the, the town that the film was shot in is my hometown where I grew up, you know. So um, I, when I was a little boy, I always, the town was pretty conservative, you know, like, uh, uh, and like a working class kind of industrial town. And um, I just always felt kind of like I didn't fit in, you know, like a bit of an outsider. And when I was growing up, when I was a little sort of queer boy or, you know, about to be queer boy. And um, so I would see this man uh, around town when I was a little kid. I would ride my bike downtown. And there was a very flamboyant man that, you know, wore like cocktail rings on every finger and a, and a fedora hat. and like scarf and smoked a um, long brown more cigarette and um, he was very like elegant and um, and you know kind of glamorous and so I he looked like nobody else he looked completely different than everyone else in the town you know so he was very different and so I I felt like I related to him and um, I so Years later, when I got older, we had a gay, gay bar in my hometown called the Universal Fruit and Nut Company. Um, and, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and that's what it was. But it, when I was 17 years old, I got up the nerve to go into the bar, and I was afraid and trembling, and, you know, and I opened the door and walked in, and on the dance floor, there was this man, the Pat, that I had seen, you know, the, very, the same flamboyant man that I had seen, like, growing up. And so I sort of felt like I was home, you know, like I had found my, my new family or place, place in the world. And um, so, yeah, he was always a big, kind of like my muse, you know, like an inspiration. And uh, I always wanted to pay tribute to him in a film uh, because he, and people like him, Uh, you know, in the in America in the 70s, 80s, even in the 60s, he always had the courage to be himself. And so I, I wanted to, um, you know, make Swan Song is sort of a love letter to, to people that, like Mr. Pat, who changed the world. 
Tom, I'm, after what you just said, I'm going to dare to say something. Um, I'm going to dare to say that this is more than just a biopic. It's, it's more like a personal film and a bittersweet one. Mm. Uh, am I right? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yes. Yeah, bittersweet, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, because, uh, you know, in America, the, these small town gay bars are disappearing. I don't know about here, what what's going on here, but um, in America, uh, it's great because, like, uh, it's more acceptable to be gay in uh, openly, you know, even in small towns like where I grew up. But what's happening is the the, the you know, bars and places as it becomes more acceptable also because of apps and that's how people meet and so the bars are um, going out of business a lot of them and so it's like uh, it's it's amazing um, uh, that we don't need those places as much you know anymore but on and, and one hand but it's also sad because uh, that was the that was a family like a culture you know small town queer culture was like a thing and uh, Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> that was better. Oh, I see, yeah. Um, and uh, so it's kind of bittersweet, you know. So not only is it the swan song of someone's life, it's kind of the swan song of a, of an era in gay culture in, in America. So I bet everyone wants to know about Udo Kier, ah, of course. Yeah. So there's a thing about Udo Kier, I think, is that he has this sort of gravitational force of attraction, this mm -hmm. magnetism, and I'm saying this as a movie goer. Mm -hmm. So I want to know how it is when you have to actually meet him, when you have to work with him, when you have to direct him. <laughs> um, well, same. I mean, when I first met him, it's like, wow, you know, and, uh, and, and he lives in Palm Springs, California, and I flew there to meet him, and he introduced me to his dog, Liza Minnelli, um, and, uh, and so that was, so we got along really well right away. I knew, Udo, we did a Kickstarter campaign, I saw some of the films that were just uh, there that they were funded, you know, in part with Kickstarter campaigns, and that's how we started Swan Song, um, and Udo got very involved in that, like we, he did a video with me and helped me raise money for the movie. So by the time we shot the movie, we had known each other for like a year, and um, we were friends, you know? Um, and now, you know, we talk on the phone every other day. Uh, we're, we're kind of like family now, so. Um, he's still magnetic, but uh, you know, he drives me crazy sometimes in a way, but I love him. <laughs> there, there's he's some... been to this festival before. Yeah, yeah he's been here, yeah. Uh, there's something that I found particularly special about the movie. Uh, so I want you to talk about the look and feel of the movie. I, I love both the way the movie looks and the tone. I mean, the color scheme and even some naturalistic resources that you used. So what was important for you when you decided the presentation that the movie was going to have? the way it was going to look? Yeah. I mean, really, ideally, I wanted it to, to be shot on film. I, you know, like, I wanted to shoot it on super 16 millimeter film. But, you know, it was a low-budget film, and we didn't really have the money for that. But um, we tried to make it look as filmic and cinematic as possible. We rented these old lenses from the 70s called Super Baltar lenses. They're like vintage, uh, you know, uh, old Hollywood lenses that just gave the movie a bit of a, a warm feel and a little bit of a soft feel. It, it was all, the, the film is all about somebody who's sort of dead inside, rediscovering their love of life. So I wanted the colors to start off being very drained and very desaturated and sort of as Mr. Pat, you know, got escaped from his nursing home and, you know, going back to town and starting to kind of become more alive, we kind of started to make the color scheme brighten it up. And by the end, it's like, you know, it's pretty bright and poppy. Um, and I also wanted it to be shot sort of documentary style, the whole thing shot handheld. I had an amazing cinematographer named Jackson Warner Lewis. And, um, you know, we shot the movie in 18 days. It was, it was pretty fast. So, uh, but, but that, which in a way is hard, but it also, it just captures like a reality when you're working that fast. You know, we have, we only have time to do two or three takes, and um, 
but there's something real about it that, that comes through when you're shooting that that quickly. Eh, a los compañeros de la prensa, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, con toda confianza, este, nos piden la palabra y encantados a ver por acá. Hi. Hi. Um, uh, yes. yeah. In your movies, the music always is important. Ah. The music is the boom. In, in the age of 17, Gypsy 83, the music is very important. Yeah. How do you consider a... The soundtrack, how do you make the soundtrack in your movies? You know, when I start writing it, I make like a playlist, even before I start writing the script. Like I have, back in the old days, it would be like on a cassette tape, like a mixtape. Um, but I, I, I start, I love music, and, it, and um, it inspires me to come up with ideas, you know? So, like I, I'll usually, uh, when I'm writing something, I have like, 20, 30 songs that I'm listening to while I write it. So the songs kind of just get into the, you know, pores, like the DNA of the, of the film. And um, I've had a good luck to have like a really good music supervisor who's the person that gets the rights to the, the because, you know, that's, it can be expensive. Uh, but um, in a case like Swan Song, and a lot, in Swan Song, a lot of the songs that are in it were the real Mr. Pat's favorite songs, you know. Um, so, yeah, I've been thinking, I've been thinking about this film for like 20 years, so I've been thinking about listening to these songs for decades, and um, we're so lucky that we got the rights to Judy Garland and Dusty Springfield and, you know, uh, all these, ama uh, Shirley Bassey and all that kind of like old school stuff, you know, but um, thank you for noticing that, yeah, it's like, it's, music is like my inspiration for writing. Yeah. That's uh, such a fantastic question because yeah. you can't help but notice the role that music plays in, in, in Swan Song. I mean, Judy Garland, Shirley Bassey, my yeah. personal favorite, Dusty Springfield, yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, even Robin. Robin. So, yes. uh, did it take a lot of research to find uh, the songs that were meaningful to Pat? Uh, Well, I, I talked to Pat's friends, you know, I knew him a little bit, you know, but, but um, I talked to his friends and I got to know his lover David before he died and um, I, one time I saw him do drag, like one time in my life and he did the Shirley Bassey, this is my life song, where he's riding on a little scooter. And um, so I just gotten to know that those were, you know, those were his favorite. Judy Garland he loved and... So, yeah, yeah, it, it did, it, and there are also songs I loved, you know, so, yeah. ¿Alguien más tiene por allí alguna eh, pregunta? Sí. Hey, Todd, uh, José Roberto Lando Verde from Senior Premier. Um, uh, I was wondering, I noticed that there was a, the film had like this duality, you know, in, in the way it plays out, you know, it's a, uh, very upbeat um, project, but at the same time, it um, manages to put into the mix something as very sad as, you know, death, you know? Pat has to uh, go out and do a last makeup for a friend. Um, so I was wondering, what led you to the choice of, you know, um, putting a those two teams uh, sort of like to fight with each other and why why did you why did you do that <laughs> you know I, I I don't really consciously think about it I, I, I just it's like a lot of the stuff that I do just has like it, it people laugh and then there's like emotional You know, like you might laugh and cry, and it's just, I, I don't know, I, I, to be honest, it's just like what's inside me, I guess. I love things that are melancholy, bittersweet, you know, both happy and sad, yin-yang, kind of, that's life, you know. Um, so, I it just, it's not really, it doesn't come from here, it comes from here, you know, so that's all I can say. But thank you for noticing that. Um, yeah, I, I okay. So I want to address that sad mood, the mm -hmm. sadness in the movie, because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there are sad moments during the movie, but, but also there's 
one particular moment that I found moving during the closing credits because I watched the whole closing credits. <laughs> Thank you. So I noticed that you guys acknowledge and you guys remember every single person who died during the AIDS epidemic. Yes. So I think that is a discreet but powerful statement in the movie, even if it's, in, if, if it's hidden in the credits. So mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit about it. Well, you know, I mean, even in a small town like Sandusky, Ohio, AIDS, uh, when, when AIDS first, we first heard about it in the early, early 80s, we thought, it's never going to come here. That's a New York City thing, you know, that kind of thing. But, um, but it took a couple years, but then when it did come, it hit, uh, it hit very hard. And um, a lot of people, you know, there's way more people that I, th those were people that I knew who passed away that I put in the credits. But, um, you know, that's the thing about somebody like Mr. Pat's life. I, I mean, I think to that generation of, of gay person, they, so many people died. I've talked to so many gay men that live that have like an address book where half or three quarters of it is erased. You know what I mean? Because like literally they're almost everyone in their friends, lovers, you know, passed away. Um, it was a, it was a pandemic. I mean, it was a pandemic. It was, it was, um, so, uh, yeah, that, that's part of the sadness. I think that, that it is, that is there too, is that loss, you know? Um, but I really wanted to acknowledge, uh, Acknowledge the people that that even for my little town that that were lost to AIDS because that that really shaped um, me and it, I mean it shaped the world but especially a, a gay kid that was coming out right when when AIDS first started basically. Alguna otra pregunta por acá. Hi Todd, uh, I would like to know how did you develop the main character together with Dudo uh, in order to highlight uh, his outstanding talent but at the same time without losing the essence of Mr. Bat? Um, good question. You know, when I, when I cast Udo, uh, I rewrote the script and I took out a lot of dialogue. <laughs> um, because Udo expresses himself so well without having to even speak, you know? And the real Mr. Pat was very, he was very flamboyant, but he was very soft-spoken. He would just say a couple of words here and there, you know? So that was true to the character, but um, I just felt like you just see so much in Udo's eyes without having to explain it. So, um... That, that was one big thing. And I think that the movie, I think some of the sadness and melancholiness, like I think when I first wrote it, I thought of it a little more as a comedy than it, than it wound up. Um, I, when I first wrote the script, I had Gene Wilder, Willy Wonka in my head to play the, the lead part. Um, and, uh, and, but with Udo, it just took on more depth gravita you know what I mean it just took on more depth and that's just the way that the universe wanted the movie to happen but yeah he and I didn't rehearse um, I usually rehearse every film I do and Udo did not want to rehearse which scared the hell out of me at first you know um, but he's very much a person that doesn't want to plan what he's going to do but to just be in the moment and, and feel, be in the moment and be real, you know? And that's, I think, his brilliance, you know? The, the one big request he did have was that we shot the movie in order, like the, in sequence, which usually you can't do when you're doing a film. But this one, since he kind of walked from one place to another, we were able to, to do that. So, you know, Udo kept saying every time I talked to him, can we please start in the nursing home, start in the nursing home? And um, so we were able to do that. So as, you know, he, the character really came back to life, you know, like throughout the sequence of the shoot. Um, and that, that really helped both Udo and I shape the performance. Yeah. He's, he's amazing to work with. I mean, it's like, you know, I, uh, I felt like I was watching a master class in acting every time I was on the set. You know? And I didn't really need to direct him very much. Alguna otra pregunta por aquí? Um, Todd, in speaking about cinema, um, what kind of things provokes you frustration as a creator, as a director, as a storyteller? Frustration? Yes. Getting the money. <laughs> Beyond that? Uh, 
What do you mean? Frust what do you mean? Tell yeah, me. A be, yeah, because uh, and uh, director, when I have to face the, the thing of budget logic, logic but you have to face the stretch. But yeah. in order to get the cast, the story completed, you you were spoken about lens. How many other uh, film or uh, film director have to face to to get the movie complete? I mean, really, honestly, the biggest thing is getting the money together, you know, like that, that is really the biggest nightmare. And a lot of times when you're doing independent film, you're also one of the producers. So you're literally not only having to think about the writing, directing, but also like, where are we going to get the money? Or we're in the middle of the shoot and we don't have enough money to finish the movie, you know, and all that. And, um, but, um, I, I don't know the, just the writing and directing, I mean, writing is really hard. You know, the right for me, the writing part, and sometimes there'll be years that go by before I really come up with an idea that I'm willing to like uh, sacrifice. You know, year because it's like a commitment of many years of your life to make a film, and then it's like, and then it's like it, it's with you forever. You know, so. Um, but the directing part is just when that when it actually starts happening, I'm just like on a cloud nine. I'm just in paradise. You know, like it. It's, sometimes it can be frustrating that you don't have enough time to shoot or whatever, but uh, once once the camera starts rolling, I'm in heaven. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Tom. Um, I, I just wanted to pay you back of uh, the question about building the character with Udo. More specifically, what was the most important part for you in portraying this real character, this real person? What was the most important element about the essence of the character or the person that was Mr. Pat that you wanted to portray perfectly? Getting him to hold the cigarette right. <laughs> Honestly. I mean, Udo kept, you know, hey man, you know, it's like he kept, uh, he kept holding the cigarette wrong. And I kept saying, Udo, put your hand back, put your hand back. You know, because like the pictures, and, and Mr. Pat always like had his lighter, like a big lighter, just as you could see it in the poster. You know, he always had his lighter in his hand and it's just like, you know, this kind of thing. So sometimes Udo was like this, you know, hand back, hand back. Okay. You know, so honest to God, that was like the, the biggest challenge. Um, just to get him to be like a little bit, a little bit more flamboyant. Yeah, good question. That's Última good. pregunta, por favor. The last. Okay. 13 years since your last film. What's that? 13 years passed since your last film. Can we can expect a new movie oh. in a minute time this time? Oh, not in 12 years later? Yeah, I hope <laughs> not. I hope not. Yeah, I'm starting to write uh, new stuff now. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope it's not. I hope to God it in a couple of years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Todd, thank you very much for yeah. being here. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, you're going to screen tonight the mm -hmm. movie for the first time here in Mexico. Yeah. yeah. So, what do you want people to remember about Swan Song? Uh, remember about it. Um, I mean, the biggest, the biggest thing that I want people to remember overall is like, um, live while you're breathing. You know, like it's like. Even though Mr. Pat, I think, has given up on life, and and he, you know, he he's lost so much of his world, and he's lost all his money, and he lost his lover, and he lost his house, and all of his friends. So he's kind of like given up on himself. But um, you know, as long life is short, you know, like I think as we get older, we realize that life just life we're just here like for a moment, and so um, it's never too late to like. Be yourself and live your best life, and um, that's what I would want people to take from it most of all. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the Guanajuato International Film thank Festival. You. Have a great night tonight. Ay, muchas gracias a todos los colegas de la prensa. Eh, y bueno, continúa ya saber programa de ahí. actividades el día de hoy. Y nada, pues a ver la película en la noche, va. Gracias. Thank you guys. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.